Is keeping reptiles in captivity ethical? I think so, but only if it's done right. My name is Hunter Hauk, and in today's video, I'm going to be deep diving into the ethics of keeping reptiles and amphibians in captivity. This is a topic that when I made this video, a lot of people were like, hey Hunter, talk about the ethics of reptile keeping. And so I spent many, many hours writing this video, doing lots of research and all that good stuff. So this should be a really beneficial video to anyone who's trying to debate whether keeping reptiles is ethical, what makes it ethical, and what is an example of unethical reptile keeping. The reptile hobby relies greatly on the zoo world to learn about our animals. More than any other group of animals, we can easily replicate zoo-like environments in our own homes for the animals that we keep. Because of this, I wanted to mention a section from the Association of Zoos and Aquariums Code of Professional Ethics real quick. Now, of course, this as well as all other sources can be found at the link on screen and in the description. One of the first things mentioned in the AZA Code of Ethics is this. Our profession is based on respect for the dignity of the animals in our care. That's one of the first sentences, and I think it's super important to think about. This sentence from the Code of Ethics can apply to the reptile hobby just as much as the zoo profession. I love these reptiles, and because I love them, I also respect them, and if you love and keep reptiles, you should respect them too. Moving on, I want to talk about something called the Five freedoms of animal welfare, sometimes just referred to simply as the five freedoms. This was originally made a long time ago as a standard for keeping livestock, and then later it was adopted by veterinarians and the zoo field for all animals that are kept in captivity. The five freedoms have evolved over time because we've learned more about animals and their needs. Here they are. First is freedom from hunger or thirst. Number two is freedom from discomfort. Three is freedom from pain, injury, or disease. Four is freedom to express most natural behavior. And somehow I forgot to mention it while I was recording, but five is freedom from fear and distress. These seem like a great set of outlines for animal care, but there's another outline that is even better suited for exotic animals. I also prefer it because it's set as opportunities for positive things instead of freedoms from negatives. This outline that I'm talking about is called the Opportunities to Thrive. It was originally created by some keepers at the San Diego Zoo, and in this section of today's video I'm going to be mentioning each of the five opportunities to thrive, and briefly talking about how we can apply each of them to captive reptile husbandry. First is opportunity for a well-balanced diet. An example of applying this is instead of just giving your insectivorous reptile like a leopard gecko, for example, all mealworms or all crickets, you can mix in mealworms, crickets, dubia roaches, a variety of food so that they have a well-balanced diet and they have opportunities to try different foods. Number two is the opportunity to self-maintain, and this is one of the easiest ones to apply to keeping reptiles. For example, if you have a snake, their enclosure should have a humid microclimate, if it's appropriate for the species, where they can go to properly shed. Number three is the opportunity for optimal health. It's important that we provide an environment for our reptiles that increases the likelihood of them being healthy and decreases the likelihood of them becoming unhealthy and injured. For example, making sure that all of your heating is dialed in and frequently checking it to ensure optimal temperatures, which promotes optimal health and prevents burns. Number four is the opportunity to express species-specific behaviors. This is, in my opinion, one of the opportunities that the reptile hobby too often forgets or chooses not to provide to their animals. An example of providing this opportunity to express species-specific behavior is making sure that the enclosure allows the 
reptile to climb if that's something that they do in nature or dig if that's something they do in nature. The fifth and final of the five opportunities to thrive is the opportunity for choice and control. An example of providing the opportunity for choice and control is in a bearded dragon enclosure, you can have different textures, humidities, and heights. You can do that by having a dig box for texture and humidity and a hammock for them to climb. Personally, I like to think about these freedoms when creating a reptile enclosure. Let's talk about how I implemented these five opportunities to thrive when creating my Plains Hognose Briar's enclosure. This is Briar. As I mentioned, she is my Plains Hognose. When creating her enclosure last year, I focused on the five opportunities to thrive because I wanted her to have the best suited enclosure possible. The first opportunity, the opportunity for a well-balanced diet, is simple. I offer her appropriately sized frozen thawed mice approximately every seven days. When she's older, I'll also mix in other types of prey to make her diet even more balanced. Next is the opportunity to self-maintain. When I think about self-maintenance in a snake, I think about two major things. The first is hydration, and that's easy. I have a water bowl in her enclosure where she has access to fresh, clean water at all times. Next is shedding. When mixing moss into her substrate, I added more on one side. The moss holds extra humidity on this side, allowing her to find the humidity that she wants at a given time. The humidity gradient encourages proper shedding and prevents dysictesis, which <laughs> that's one of the trivia words that I could not remember for the life of me at the Snake Discovery build-off, so that word will haunt me forever and I will never forget it. Next, we have the opportunity for optimal health. If she ever needs to see an exotic vet, I will make sure that she has that opportunity. I personally have savings set aside so that if any of my reptiles need emergency vet care, I can immediately provide that for them. The opportunity to express species-specific behavior is one that is very important with reptile care. There were two main behaviors that I thought about when creating Briar's enclosure. These were climbing and digging. Hog noses have a hog noses because they have evolved to dig and burrow. To ensure the opportunity for this behavior, she has a deep layer of substrate. To ensure the opportunity to climb, Briar's enclosure has pieces of wood as well as a cork background. Opportunities for choice and control, in the case of Briar's enclosure, come from its size. She has the opportunity to choose and control how warm or cool she is based on her proximity to or distance from the basking spot. She also has the ability to choose and control how much humidity she is exposed to by moving to or away from the humid end of her enclosure. As I think I've demonstrated, implementing the five opportunities to thrive in your reptile care and thinking about them when creating enclosures and care plans is a great way to ensure that you're keeping your reptiles ethically and in a way that's going to make them thrive. If you want to be able to remember the five opportunities to thrive, take a screenshot of the graphic that's on the screen right now. Now that I've talked about how to make sure that your reptile care is ethical, let's talk about some things that are unethical. Just like earlier, I'm going to be using the five opportunities to thrive as our basis for ethical animal keeping. In this section of today's video, I'm going to be talking about some things that I see often or even just occasionally in the reptile hobby that either are or may be unethical in my opinion. First, we're going to be talking about people prioritizing the number of reptiles that they keep over the quality of their reptile care. We see this all too often when people decide that they want to start breeding reptiles. They want to make lots of money so they get lots of snakes, so that they can produce lots of babies, so that they can make lots of money, and to do this, they have to have smaller enclosures for their new mini, mini snakes. These enclosures are usually tubs that don't provide them the opportunity to climb or dig or hide or practice choice and control. Right off the bat, that breaks a few of our rules. Note that I'm not completely writing off tubs here. I'm just talking about the ones specifically that have no enrichment and that take away some of the opportunities to thrive. First, we've removed opportunity number four, which is the opportunity to express species-specific behaviors. 
If you can't completely stretch out in your enclosure, then you certainly can't dig or climb. We've also removed the opportunity for choice and control. In an enclosure like this, a snake can't choose anything about its environment. Finally, this removes the opportunity for optimal health. Many people with big collections of reptiles only check on them on feeding day, for example. If you aren't giving regular, individualized attention to each of your reptiles, you're less likely to notice when something is wrong or one is sick and when they need vet care. Now, when I've mentioned this in the past, a lot of people have come back at me with, Hunter, a lot of people can't afford to have large reptile enclosures. They have to be able to fit a lot of snakes in their house or their room so that they can have enough snakes to breed enough babies to make enough money. That raises the question of whether it's ethical to breed snakes for a living if you can't provide them with optimal conditions. Personally, I'd prefer to support small batch reptile breeders, a term coined by, I believe, T.C. Houston of Reptile Mountain, who produce fewer numbers of animals, but in higher quality conditions. Another ethical issue that removes some of the opportunities to thrive is breeding certain morphs of reptiles that have issues. First, we're going to be talking about albino green iguanas. First, I want to mention that I had a lot of trouble finding actual scientific research done on this specific morph. More research is definitely necessary. Now, what could be wrong with albino green iguanas? Green iguanas are typically provided with UVB levels that fall within Ferguson zone number three. That means that they're partial or open sun baskers. That's similar to bearded dragons, and if you know much about bearded dragon care, you know that they need a pretty high level of UVB. Now, albino reptiles can't be kept in environments with as high of levels of UVB as their wild-type counterparts. On page 88 of Reptile Medicine and Surgery in Clinical Practice, the author states, Albino and hypomelanistic animals which lack protective melanin may be at increased risk of UV-induced skin damage and cancer. They are likely to need much lower UV levels than normally pigmented conspecifics. This makes it difficult to ensure that they're getting proper UVB. On one hand, you could provide your albino green iguana, just this morph is just an example, with a lower level of UVB, but then they could develop bone issues. But on the other hand, you could provide them with the normal amount of UVB, but their skin could be damaged. This makes it hard to ensure optimal health. Now does breeding albino green iguanas, for example, completely remove the opportunity for optimal health? Now, that's something that I don't think enough research has been done on. Definitely leave a comment down below with your thoughts and we can have a conversation about it. Another morph of reptiles that I have an ethical issue with the breeding of is one that's a lot more commonly talked about, and that's spider bull pythons. Now, here's the thing. Most people in the reptile hobby that I've spoken to about this agree that spider bull pythons shouldn't be bred, except for the people who are making money from breeding them. Are we seeing the pattern here? Here's a quote from a paper called Neurologic Dysfunction in a Ball Python, Python Regius Color Morph and Implications for Welfare. And I quote, the spider morph is linked to a neurological disorder, the wobble syndrome. Now, I'm not gonna spend much time talking about what the wobble syndrome does because if you're watching this video, it's likely that you're already aware. In the study that I'm talking about, the data was collected from breeders who clearly have financial incentives to downplay the severity of the wobble syndrome. Even then, they reported that at least 30% of ball pythons with the spider morph had poor motor skills that caused low accuracy when the snakes try to strike at prey. The study also states that welfare scientists, and I quote, typically perceived a moderate to high welfare effect associated with the clinical signs of the wobble condition. Breeding a snake with a morph that causes torticollis, which is a condition that causes the neck muscles to kind of stiffen at an odd angle, which humans with this condition say is incredibly painful, so most likely it's painful in snakes with the condition, definitely removes the opportunity for optimal health. In case it's not incredibly clear what I'm saying here, I think it's unethical to breed snakes and other reptiles whose morph causes them to have a poor quality of life especially when there are so many other morphs available. I think most people who don't have a financial stake in their continued breeding agree. 
If we want to continue keeping reptiles, we have to do so in an ethical manner. I'd ask everyone to consider the five opportunities to thrive when thinking about their reptile care and see how you can implement them. Reptile husbandry research is constantly evolving and so reptile husbandry should be too. Keep doing your research and doing your best and most importantly, never stop asking questions. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Let me know your thoughts on what I talked about today in the comments. I'd love to have a great conversation just like we did in the comments of this video. If you know a person or group who might find this video interesting, please share it with them. It really helps this be seen by more people and it helps me to continue having this channel. If you want to see more of my videos, be sure to subscribe to my channel and turn on post notifications. We recently hit 7,000 subscribers. That means a lot that that many people want to hear me talk about reptiles, so thank you all so much. I want to say a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters for making videos like this one possible. If you want to support my channel while getting awesome perks, consider joining my Patreon for as little as $1 per month. My name is Hunter Hauk, this has been my thoughts on ethically keeping reptiles, and I hope to see you in my next video.